Ladies and gentlemen, this evening on The Unconventional Pastor, Bob Graves con continues with Phil with his series, Everybody Loves Phil, and tonight the subject is, it's just not fair. Stay tuned. fun here. This is, this is Bob this is Gray. Inside right, joke. yes. Right. And they call me Unconventional Pastor, and I'm here again with a good friend, Phil. Uh, and we're continuing this, this series of Everybody Loves Phil, because it's just, you know, the natural thing to do. And uh, what we've been doing is we've been going through some of the uh, dynamics that are present in uh, all of us uh, that uh, somehow control the way it is we come to think of ourselves. And, um, you know, without repeating too much, I, I basically uh, am one of these people who would argue that we never really know who we really are, nor do we really need to, but we nonetheless have kind of a working model. And it's important that our working model is loosely held because uh, we need to be open to discovering we're not who we think we are, but we also need to loosely hold it because a lot of the information that we've assessed to conclude this is who we are was information that was just plain false. And tonight, I actually want to talk about how some of that information is just not fair. You know, it's not fair. And uh, so as we've been talking about this, one of the things I wanted to begin with is this. You've ever heard, you, you've heard this thing about, you know, you can't compare apples and oranges, right? Right. What? And the reason, of course, is because, well, you know, what? They're two completely different fruits. Now, the thing is this. Um, you have an experience of yourself that includes information I don't have. For example, you know what you're thinking. I can only guess at what right, you're thinking. Right. You don't know what I'm thinking. If you only knew what I was thinking right now. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can, I can uh, know what I'm thinking, or at least I think I know what I'm thinking, but I can only guess what you're thinking. What, what, what I'm basically saying is this. You have access to certain private information about you that I don't. Sure. And I have access to private information about me that you don't. So how can you compare yourself to me or how can I compare myself to you when there's a sense in which the way that I know you and the way that I know me, we're talking about a difference here like apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. You know, what it does is I compare the self I know, including my private information, blinded a little bit by the fact that I really don't see how others see me. And I'm comparing that to just how I see you. So the question is this, unless I have some special training, can you see how I would have some trouble actually having proper and good judgments about you if I'm going to compare apples and oranges? What you're seeing is just a... Uh a loose framework of me. What I see is, you're, yeah, you're right. Seeing a, right. You're seeing a, a presentation. Right. Presentation, right. 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 Yeah. Right. And, but what I have of myself, for example, if I do something that you might think of as mean, but I understand why I'm doing it, mm -hmm. I won't see it as mean. But if you're doing it, I see it as mean. It's an interpretation on both sides. It is. It is. However, it's an unfair interpretation because what if you're doing something that I think of as mean, but you have your reasons for doing it that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. I'm judging myself as not mean based on private information I have, and I'm judging you as mean, not taking into consideration information that's private to you. So the truth is we each come at this mm -hmm. kind of assessment of self, assessment of others, using a completely different standard. Now, there's, I think this is important to understand because this works both ways. We have private information about ourselves 
and we have uh, we don't have the private information about others who do have that private information about themselves. You know, in this culture, I think it's true, and maybe you could agree with this, that most of us are either, you know, we, we, we don't think much of ourselves or we're kind of stuck on ourselves. How many people do you know who seem to have a, a really positive but balanced sense of who they are? Don't you think that there's somebody kind of yeah. and, and and I think that the reason why we do that is not because we as human beings are inept, it's because I don't think we always stop to think about that difference that I judge myself based on the awareness of private information and I judge others based on public information. And when I try to make the comparison, I realize something isn't working. I may not realize, oh, apples and oranges. I may not realize that. And when I don't realize that, I either try to compensate for this difference or this discrepancy by either being overly harsh on myself or overly gracious to myself. Okay. Does it make sense? Yeah. So there's a yeah. sense here which it isn't fair. Right. It's not fair. It's not fair. So this means if you're if you're looking down at yourself, there's a high likelihood that you're not being fair. And it's based upon judgments other gave others gave you where they weren't being they weren't being fair. You internalize it. Well you can, right. And and the problem is you're internalizing something that you've taken in that isn't fair. Right. It's not an honest judgment. Now when we talk about the way we feel about ourselves, would would you agree that we should feel good about ourselves or bad about ourselves? Oh, good. Good about ourselves. In a sense, I think that's true. Yeah. However, is it good to feel good about yourself just because it's good? You know? I mean, for example, okay. well, let's pretend that you're you're in my you're in a park and you're gonna take a zip line ride, and I'm the zip line operator, and I feel good about myself. I think I'm a good zip line operator. And you're going to sit on this zip line. What, 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 you know what a zip, zip line is? Line. No, no, oh. no. You got to explain that. Okay. A zip line is a uh, is a big wire that goes from up on top of a of a hill or a mountain and goes to some place down near the bottom of the oh, hill okay, or a mountain. Okay, okay. And then you sit in this chair that then uh, you know right, right, goes right. along the zip line. Right. It's kind of exciting, it's a little scary. Oh, you're yeah. up in the air, you're moving at a pretty Don't good you speed. You ever take me in. <laughs> Now, let's say that I'm the zip line operator and you're going to go down this. Now, do you want me to be somebody who feels like, well, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to make the no, zip lines. No, I, no, no. I want no. somebody who's got <laughs> right. positive but, energy. Yeah, that's true. But at the same time, do you want me to also be somebody or would you rather have somebody like this? Hey, I've been doing this for 15 years. I know what I'm doing. You know, these things have been working fine for 10 years. They've been here. Is there a problem in this? Absolutely not. I know what I'm doing. I don't think you'd want that either. I don't know. No, no, no. Wouldn't you want somebody who, instead of being just positive, could be honest? No, let's let's assess the line today. Let's make sure that there's no choking going on in the pulley. Right, let's right, make sure right. that everything's the way it should be. Right. And let's be honest and have nothing to prove positive or negative. Right. So I think it is true that it's good to have a positive view of ourselves, but not a falsely positive view. There's, it's got to be authentic. And I think that if we are authentic, we can find in that real positive be, things. Be true to ourselves. Right. Yeah. So, so it's not like we need to be, you know, stabbing ourselves in the back, but we don't want to be positive just because it feels good to be positive. Right. That's right. what I'm, yeah. So it's knowing, right. It's really knowing. Now. Yeah. Right. Now, if you were a, uh, a three-year-old and you brought me a drawing and you brought me a drawing of a, of some stick figures and you're three-year-old and I could say, Phil, that's really good. You know, can you tell me who that is? And maybe, you know, and I can do this. But, you know, you're in your, you know, you're in your 60s now. And if you were to bring me a drawing and it's just these stick figures and I were to say, oh, Phil, that's really good. You know, you're full of crap. <laughs> there's something a little disingenuous yeah, yeah, about it. Yeah. So there's a sense in which praise is a good thing to give. But when praise is given that is disingenuous or right. about things that really aren't you know, praiseworthy, then something's off. So we're, we're talking about, we, we want to have a positive self-image, but we want it to be built on authentic positives. Right, right, right. right. Not only that, but it's not necessarily a negative thing to recognize negative things. Well, weren't we talking about that uh, off, off the air? We were talking about faults, uh, um, like society today. Mm -hmm. The kids are being taught 
Everybody's great. You're great. It you know, doesn't work. You're what you did is wonderful. You're all winners. No, you're not, we're not all winners. There are we all need to face certain things in ourselves that are things we need to work on. And that's perfectly okay that there's things we need to work right. on. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you treat your child that you're just fine just the way you are and there's nothing to work on, what do they do? They don't work on it. False praise. Yeah. False and praise. And 10 years later they're spoiled kids. Right. And they expect that praise if but you're going to get anything. Do you out agree of it. that's part of the problem with definitely. our society? Yeah, I think it's a serious problem in our schools these days. Yeah. It's part of why, you know, as a college professor, I'm dealing with students who um, you know, it's kind of like I have a homework assignment and you didn't do it and so I'm giving you a failing grade. Oh, you you were serious about that? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, I was. And, uh, yeah, and the grade shows it, you know. But uh. No, but when, when I was growing up, when I was going to school, if you didn't, uh, if you weren't up to snuff, you had to work. Yeah. The, the work ethic is missing in our right. society today. Yeah. Now, let's go back, though, to look at this. A lot of the things that you think are true about you are things that you learn from other people telling you what's true about you. Right. Yeah. To some degree. Yeah. And and in a sense, that will often be true, mm -hmm. both positive and negative. Sometimes people can assure you, Phil, I think you're a wonderful guy. I'm so glad you're my friend. And and there's some ways in which the interaction we have, it is, in a sense, me telling you things that give you information that help you assess how you're perceived. And you can consider that and either own it or not. You know, so a great deal of what we think about ourselves is based on information we get through interactions with other people. Right, right. But let's remember, many of these people are not making these assessments by being fair. And it's worse than that. Some of them are actually sabotaging you. For example, now, now I haven't talked to you enough to know if this is true in your case, but while you were growing up, were there people who were overly protective of you? Um, yeah, yeah. Now, Usually when people are overprotective, that's because well, they care about you and they don't want you to get hurt. But think about it. When you're overprotected, what does it make you say about yourself? Mm. Well, you become dependent on other people. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I so can't you lose do that. that. You lose that dependence. Yeah. yeah. I independence. Can, I can definitely say this in my case. I was raised in a home where um, my mother, for whatever reason, this is not meant to be a criticism of her, but my mother was so busy or whatever that she never really paid much attention to me, except when I was in pain or hurting, or if I seemed to have a problem or needed her help or protection. Then she was just thrilled to be able to rise to the occasion and be mom. But, in, but part of that was this, that I didn't like being abandoned. I didn't like being ignored. I didn't like being neglected. I liked getting attention. And when did I get attention? When I needed protection, when I wasn't doing right, or when I wasn't working, and when things were falling apart. And what does this do? There's a sense here in which feeling inept feeling like I need that protection has a payoff for me. Mm -hmm. It is something that I want to do because it brings me the attention I need. So there's the sense in which she was in that way. Um, I don't know that, that overprotective would necessarily be the proper way of talking about it, but she was certainly protective only at those times. You know, she interacted with me only when there was a time for doing that. And, and I think in many ways that, that kept me from moving forward because why move forward and get uh, capable at something when the only way she's going to pay attention to me is if I do something that I can't do and it falls apart and then she'll pay attention to me. Right. You right, know? Right. So there's a sense in which although that may, I don't know, I didn't know her well enough to be able to say this. Maybe that was the moment when she's finally arrested and realizes she needs to care about me. Mm -hmm. But the message it sends to me is one that keeps me sabotaged. I take from that and I, not that I have to. So consequently today, I pay attention to people who are trying to protect me. And sometimes I appreciate their care and concern. But other times, uh, and there's sometimes when I, I need help. I do. And I, I think it's um, important. Support. Right. Support. And sometimes it's important. Emotional to be a, support. Like when my house was destroyed in a flood. Right. 
There are people who came by, gave me a thousand dollars. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, now, what am I going to say? Well, look, you know, I really should be doing this on my own, and 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 you know, I I really don't want to have this uh, this enabling relationship with you. Uh, I'm telling you, my At house that was point, destroyed. It's, it's, welcome. It, it's exactly. welcome. Exactly. So I think we need to be able to receive that kind of help, right. but we have to be aware of the fact that the people who protect you in your life. People try to make sure people don't harm you. People don't want you to do this because you might get hurt. People who don't want you to take on that job because you might not know what you're doing. People who say, you know, I don't want you to embarrass yourself, so don't try playing that when you're out, you know? Yeah. That overprotection might be coming from people who mean well, but it sabotages yes. you. Yeah. It's unfair. I had a mother like that. Okay, right. Yeah. Loved and, her to death. She, lo you know. And, and and this is not to be. This is not to criticize her intentions or her motives or her care or concern about you. But it is to say that it does have that impact on you. The good news is this: to whatever degree that has made you feel like the bottom of the totem pole is where you belong, we now know that's bogus. That's not where you belong. The conclusions you drew from that were. Incorrect conclusions drawn upon information where you were getting the wrong message. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know it's important to realize that there's people like I got some notes here. I got to take a look at here. Okay, now there's other people who are going to come into your uh, into your life uh, where these people are. Um... <laughs> I heard that. I heard that. I heard that. Yeah. But uh, anyhow, um, and we got, we got, we have. <laughs> was that the voice of God? <laughs> ooh, ooh. Is that the room? Yeah, there, there will be people who come come into your life who um, they feel inferior about themselves, and the way they try to hide that is by trying to make sure whenever you're looking good, they put you down. Have you ever had anybody like that? Had, yes. Right. Yes. Now, if you have more than one person who does that. And you've got somebody overprotecting you. You realize, well, I can't defend myself against that. Can you see how these are people? It's not just an unfair apples and oranges thing. This is a rotten apple, right? It's called the George McFly syndrome. <laughs> it can be. But people are just putting right, right down. Right. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get into that. I'm and... afraid of confrontation. <laughs> yeah. Oh, please. It's okay. Yeah. Marty. I like the way he had different personalities based on the way different <laughs> different um, versions of history worked out. That, that was, that's that was... what you're getting at. It's it, the George well, exactly. McFly syndrome. Right. That the, the right. person you think you are is based in some ways upon the history. And your history could have really been anything depending on how the different people were around you, what time you were in, all that stuff. So there's a sense in which this assessment you have of yourself isn't even real. It's based upon real circumstances, but you would have become a very different person in the way you saw yourself if you'd just been in very different circumstances. Yes. So yes. consequently, the person you've come to see yourself as can't possibly be who you really are. It's just your working model. Well, you know what you yeah. should you know you should tell your viewers? What? Watch Back to the Future because that, that sums it up. Okay. I mean, that, that's it. Right Watch there. Back to the Future because that to... sums it up. No, that, really. Yeah, yeah. Seriously. Well, he know, goes back in time, changes all the circumstances the, of his father, his mother. That theme and is really, definitely it, it's there. It's funny, right. but it's, yeah. it's somewhat you know, true. Yeah, that theme is there that he realizes that it's the circumstances that shape us. Now, this is it, it shapes our sense of ourselves. We are still the same self. We're just constrained by the shaping. It's important that we realize that because when you realize the self I see myself as is a constrained self, I can know that's not me. That means it's very likely you are a person far more capable, far more um, uh, unknown, f far more worthy of exploring than you've ever realized. Yes. yes. And that's the truth. The, all, all those barriers you see are illusions created by those circumstances. Now, this is the person who puts you down. So this is a rotten apple. We're not just comparing apples and oranges, which is already a false standard. We're, we're talking about some bad apples who, whose need is to put you down. There's also people you've had in your life um, that um, had to kind of be on top. They had to win, and in order to win, you had to lose. They will do things, but now these people aren't always overt. Sometimes, hey, Phil, I'd really love to help you out here. Here's what I'd like you to do. You know, I want you to – and then, then the deal they're offering you is one where you end up on the bottom and they end up on the top. <laughs> but but they, they sweet talk you into it. Now, some will be very good at doing that. Others will, will actually, you know, kind of confrontationally put you there. Or they're unaware of it. 
that they're doing. Oh, definitely, definitely often unaware of it. I can, without mentioning names, I can think of somebody whose job it was to manipulate you by the power they thought they had and uh, make sure that in any conflict, you're on the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, now, after a while, you can you can sometimes take that information and conclude things about yourself. You don't want to do that. And the last kind of person I want to talk about uh, in that sort of thing there, and see, I make sure I'm looking at my notes here, um, are, are people who, there, there's people in your life who have finally learned how to manage things, and they say, don't change nothing. You know, oh, don't change that. You know, yeah, maybe uh, I have no idea. Like, for example, there was a time when you were in partnership in your business, and now you're independent. Uh, I don't know if there was, but there may have been somebody in your life who's saying, Oh, no, 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 don't change that. You know, they just keep the status quo. We don't, we don't want to mess with the unknown here. Right. Now, these people can have good reasons for being concerned about the unknown, but there's a sense in which there's a message these people send you. The person who's protecting you, the message they're sending you is this. You're an inept person. Obviously, you are because you need protection. You really can't handle it. And obviously, they're also sending you a message that I can protect you from the things you can't protect you from. That it kind of makes you right, dependent, right. you know. And yeah. and then the person who is is you know always putting you down, there the message in there is, I'm far better than you are, you know. And and the person who's who's involved in that power struggle is basically the person who's a threat. You mess with me, you're going to get hurt, you know. And you don't want to get hurt. And and then and then you know, of course this other person it's like this it's like I'm telling you life is so damn risky you don't want to be messing with these things you don't want to be tweaking variables here you know and and it's it's well, there's you're really getting it from all sides oh yeah you? exactly wow now so this brings me back now if it's true that a lot of the the information that we use to have a sense of ourselves is based upon the way other people talk to us and treat us. Right. And right. we realize, first of all, they're not being fair. We're talking about apples and oranges. And not only that, but there's people coming at you, some of them with some of these agendas. Mm -hmm. That's bogus information. So let me ask you this. Should you be really using their behavior and their opinion of you to be considered as any sort of viable, meaningful information about you? Absolutely not. No. So this means that when you're reviewing in your own mind, and you could share something here if you wanted to, but you don't have to, um, you could think of something in your own mind of some incident you had where you can identify this person as as overprotective, as as manipulative, as um, as perhaps uh, you know knocking you down, or as you know just fear of change, and y you can you can just kind of go over that and s identify that and realize, okay, that message I was getting from them. That really says more about their, their dynamic and their agenda. And it says nothing about me that I can really use. Right? Oh, yeah. So you can throw it away. I'd say there's, what would you think, there's probably a number of lessons you've learned that you could, like, right now say, oh. well, that, 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 you know, I had a false teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had a few. I've had a few. Now, let's take a look at some of the balance there. Right? For example, um, Although I don't think you need people who are protecting you, it's not as if life doesn't have dangers. So there can be people who are concerned about you, properly concerned. But if they are properly concerned, they're also going to let you make your own mistakes. And, and some people can go the other way with it. Okay, I hope he falls flat on his face. Go ahead. You do that. You know? Oh, yeah. And, of course, in there is another message. That's not the overprotective message. That's the other protective. You're an idiot. You're going to get yourself hurt, and I can't wait. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. And then, all right. And then, then on the other side of the person who's always knocking you down is the person who feels like you know they're so inferior about themselves. They they they, they feel that by by schmoozing with you, by building you up, buttering you up, and 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 adoring you, and groveling at your feet. You know, they try to make it feel good because they're hoping you're going to be of, of use to them when you know that they like you and all that. Right. And and some of these people can be takers. Manipulative. Yeah, in, in that way. Uh, the, the and Then there's not only power people. On the other side, there are people who are what we would call passive aggressive. I can't do that. I don't know what to do. 
And these are people who somehow throw a situation in front of you where you feel if you don't act, they're going to get in trouble. And I, I, I yeah. don't want to mention anybody in particular, but I think you can see there are even people in your own life. And what happens? You become responsible for people you are not responsible for. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't care. I'm not saying you shouldn't even help out. But one thing you should understand is this. When you are helping somebody who needs help, you're helping them because they are a lovely human being, a worthwhile human being who could use some help, that you can give them help, and what a wonderful thing to do. But it is not your responsibility. There's a difference between being loving and caring and being responsible. The moment you feel responsible, now you're obligated. And the moment you're obligated, now you even resent it. But not only that, but let me ask you this. Do you have any bills? Yeah. Aren't they fun? Oh, yeah. <laughs> have they ever been a little bit overwhelming? Oh, yeah. And what if you got bills and then along come all these needy people and they need this and then, you know, it can get to a point where it puts on the pressure. Now, I can appreciate the fact that sometimes needs are really great and we don't know how to balance well, them. Well, you have to but, be practical about it. Exactly. But if you let this say something about you, you can find yourself overwhelmed. Working for everybody else and never for right, you. Right. You know? Right. You can't do that. There's got to be a balance. And then, what was it? We were talking about, uh, we were talking about the manipulator. And, and then there's the person who's afraid of change. There are some people who are actually, they're uncomfortable with everything remaining the same. These people are upheavals. You know, <laughs> kind of moving everything all over the place. They never stay in one place. They get this job. They quit. That ain't working. Then they're over here and they're doing this. And when these people come into your life, they bring in a lot of chaos and randomness. Now, the point that I'm trying to make here is this, that in life we run into a wide variety of personalities. And some of these people are close to us. Some of these people we're responsible for. Some of them are dependents. Some of them are family. Some of them are people we work with. Some of them are neighbors we have to kind of work out things with. But each of these people and the interactions we have with them are people who, based on their interaction, we're making conclusions about ourselves. And I have to ask, how viable or valid can that information be when we're dealing with people who are like this? I think you can see how easy it is for any of us to actually come up with a working definition of self that is way off the grid of reality. Right, right. And th then what we end up doing is we're living lives, but we're not living our life. We're not being us, you know? And we need to kind of way, find a way of breaking free of that. Well, people are cutting away at you. Yeah. Keep cutting away at you. In various different ways. Right. And, and then after a while, there's nothing left. Right. Or what you've got left is so bare bones. Right. Yeah. And in some ways, I think this is also true of, and you and I were talking about this, I can't remember if you did it on the air or not, but, you know, when we're told to, you know, love our neighbors ourself, implied in that is this, how can you love your neighbor in a way your neighbor really needs love? When you don't love yourself. Right. How can you love yourself when the self you think you are is based upon all of these apples and oranges and rotten apples besides, oftentimes? Well, you can misconstrue love. Oh, well, you can. Yourself too. Right. For example. For example. Um, well, I think, I, think it, I think love means to respect yourself. A, I, I would a, 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 a true respect for yourself. Not, oh, God, I love myself. Right. <laughs> you know, you can misinterpret that. Sure. And, and that's know, because, What does that mean, to love yourself? That's because we use the word love in many different ways. Yeah. I actually, I actually teach people that... To, to be comfortable in your own skin, to respect yourself. To recognize You're, the value that there is in being you. Right. I tell people that although we use the word love to talk about affection, I think affection is wonderful. I mean, for example, um, I enjoy you as a friend. I hope you enjoy me as a friend. And and that's good that we can be. <laughs> it's good that we can <laughs> that we can spend time together in a way where this is an enjoyable way of spending some time. And, and there's there, there's actually you know a, a, a brotherly kind of affection that's going on, but at the same time that's not necessarily love either. Now love can do that. But, you know, people can do that because, you know, we're, we're, we're Americans and we hate them Russians. 
So we'll have this brotherly relationship with each other while we leave them out. You know, that is not something I would consider love. But anyway, I do not see love as an emotion. I see many emotions that we confuse as love as being valuable things, but they're not love, not in the vital sense. We just use the word in a lot of ways. But the love that we really need is the love where I realize I am a human being, and that is something that is so inarticulately valuable that I don't think I even understand it, but, I, but I'm aware of it. It's, it's, it's almost an inarticulate awareness. Yes. And, and, yes. and it's that yeah. sense of value that there is, the integrity and dignity of being human. And I realize this is not exclusive to me. This is true of everyone else. Whether or not I even know them, I, I recognize they possess this dignity. And so it is this value that, that, that arrests me so much that it actually gets involved in my motivation. I find myself not wanting to do things that would violate that dignity. Right. I find myself right. wanting to do things that celebrate it, that, that make it obvious, that, 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 um, that, that bring it out, and that encourage people based on that dignity. That also means that your value as a human being is not tied up in how much money you have, whether or not you're a plasterer or the CEO of a five, Fortune 500 com, com, company. It's not tied up even in your behavior. Now, your behavior can be an issue, but it's not an issue about your existence and the dignity and the value you are as a human being. Your behavior is in some ways really an outcome of all of these conclusions properly or improperly made and your attempts to cope with it. That's what produces your behavior. So your value isn't even really based on your behavior, although the value of having you around might be, you yeah. know, and we have to protect our boundaries from people who, when they come within inside of our boundaries, violate us. But that's just their behavior. In fact, in this way, when you think of it this way, I think you can see how you can actually love somebody that you have to draw a line with. You know, you draw the line with them because they're violating you. But even this, if you realize that their behavior is unacceptable because they have issues, you can respond to their inappropriate behavior in ways that, that, that try to confront it and stop it, but for their sake, for the sake of their dignity. They're behaving in a way that really lies about the dignity they, that they're blind to, that they actually possess and have. Well, I think it's tough love you're talking about. It can be, yeah, but it's based upon that value. And so it's really right. the value. Now, if you have that value, like, like when you're, if your son when he was growing up, you know, got into trouble, throws a baseball through somebody else's window because he's angry, and you realize, ah, you got to take, uh, you got to take up this issue. You're maybe not happy, but there's a sense in which you're not happy because this boy whose value is now, in some ways, threatened by this unacceptable behavior is something you care about, and so you can even be angry because you love them, in a sense. The value speaks. The anger is a reaction to the to the threat to the value. See what I'm yes, saying? Yeah. So, so therefore, love will be free to have a wide variety of emotions that might be appropriate to the perspective and the focus. And we're talking about really putting this together in a different way. So, do, are there any particular concepts about yourself that that so far that we've talked about that you think that this actually speaks to that you can kind of see how you've bought into messages others are sending you that you now just have to realize how invalid that message is oh, yeah. I, yeah. Could, could you be specific if you're if you're uh, comfortable with that um you mean Cir circumstances that I've been through, uh, that, and that, certain people without necessarily identifying them that that you know, interacted with you in a particular way that that they were one of these you know manipulators, one of these um, uh, you know knock you downers, uh, one of these people trying to keep you overprotected. Well, someone you and I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we we, we it was, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, but there were others, and and, and oh, there were others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think my brother to some extent. So yeah, I you know I can relate to my our dynamic. My brother, mm -hmm. my older brother, um, he always had to uh, you know he was very competitive. Okay, you mentioned right. Okay, now help me out. You have two brothers. Are they both older than you, or is one of them older? Uh, one young? One's younger, one's older. Okay, all right. Okay, gotcha. My yeah. older brother was always had to win. Yeah. 
And Very in order for him to win, you had to lose. He had to make me look bad, or uh-huh. not make me look bad. Just, um, I was going to. You, you had to be a clear second. Yes, <laughs> but that was constantly. That yeah. was driven into me. Right. I'm going to be competitive. I mean, that's what he's. Right. That's what his mindset was. Now, of course, he practiced and, that a lot, didn't he? No, yeah. So he got no. He didn't make it. He didn't do that to make me feel inferior. I'm sure he didn't. He right. made. He just. I'm the older brother, Phil, and you're the right. younger brother. And and the fact that he did that all the time, or not all the time, the fact that that was a common modality for him means he got good at it. What would happen since you didn't do that all the time, you didn't practice it? You know, you practice things, you get better at them. Since you never practiced that, what happened if you tried that? I'd fall on my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, and, and the reason is... It's not in me. Right. <laughs> Well, who knows if it is or isn't, but the one thing is that the reason wasn't there is you you never had the opportunity to kind of try that on for size and work with it in a way that would work. He always had a younger brother. You're younger, you're smaller, you're not as powerful. Right. He can make up a big bit of difference, and consequently, when he does that, it works. And by the way, that's why he does it, because it works. That's why you didn't do it, because that wouldn't work. Well, you know, I feel like I'm his equal now. Today. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, we grow up. We 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 know these mellow. On. It's kind of like, have you been to high school reunions? Yeah. You know, you know the people there you know, had all these stupid little scuffles going on. You know, and you get there, and it's been twenty, thirty years, and it's like good to see you. You know, the, you know, every, everybody's just a human being anymore. You know, right. and, it, and it changes the whole whole. Bit. We all grow up, and we. But the, so these, in many ways, are coping mechanisms. They're, they're the way we try to find a way of surviving, based upon, two of your even your brother, based upon the kind of messages he got from the circumstances, the people, and the changes he's going through, right? Yep. So it's not as if it's entirely. Um, uh, therefore, we really have to take on the responsibility of responding to this. Well, the thing with my brother is there's learned behavior. Right. And I learned from my brother that I was second second place. I mean I was I was a second class citizen. Yeah. So to speak. Right. And I carried that over into my school life, Mm -hmm. friends. Right. I would let him take the leadership role. Mm -hmm. I'd always let him take the leadership. Because I'm not capable. Right. Or that's what I was being programmed. Right. That you're, yeah. you're not capable of leadership. Right. You're not, you know. Now, can you see, though, today how that's just really based upon the conclusions you had? Right. And that if right. you try to break that mold, the reason you didn't succeed at breaking that mold was not because, well, you see, that's not who you are. The reason you didn't break that mold is because you didn't have the practice and experience necessary to figure out how to make that work for you. Right. Right. So now, however, you're you're on your own. You have your own family. You know, you have your own job. And, and it's interesting that you actually have the same profession your dad had, but none, none of your other brothers do, do they? Yeah. Well, Larry. Well, my Larry, younger brother. He does. He does something similar. Something or the, similar, yeah. but not this, yeah. exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that's very interesting because many times it's the you know the eldest son who you know, becomes takes you know, over, right, right, right takes right. over dad's business, right. And so this, in a sense, alters some of those dynamics. The way no, that works. No, no, this is interesting. Okay. See what you think about this. My older brother went to college. Okay. My younger brother went to college. My two sisters went to college. I'm the only one that didn't go on to college. Wait, what do you think? I was incapable. My grades were bad and. My mother, my mother goes, well, you, you can't go on to school. Your, your grades are bad and um, forget it. You know, you're. Yeah. Now, what do you think? That, so it's, it think carried that over. Though? It carried over into a lot of my other parts of my life. It, it carried mm-hmm. over. Now, there been... I'm, I, I'm incapable of going to school. I'm incapable of this. I'm incapable of that. Look at the message. And I've been fed all this yeah, you know. Now that was a form of overprotection, wasn't it? I, I think so, to now, some degree. Yeah. It is quite possible that had you gone to college, you might have found certain challenges there. But you could also face those challenges where you felt good for the fact that you gave it a shot. You might have also found that um, that wasn't for you. You didn't. 
need to be there. I mean, was there anything you would have gone to college for if you could? Oh, yeah. Theater. Theater. Okay. Right. Okay. I can't imagine why you wouldn't have tremendously succeeded at that time. I think I would have thrived. Right. Yeah. And I don't see how the dyslexia, there are other dyslexic actors out there. And now uh, they may have trouble reading their lines, but they don't have trouble acting. And we all have, you know, strengths and weaknesses. So I don't think that 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 would have ever, I I can't imagine you not becoming an actor. Yeah. I mean, look at the way you act with me. (laughs) (laughs) You know, but no, really. Um, So that, you know, you don't strike me as the person who would like say studied physics or computer science. I mean, that's just not you. It doesn't strike me as your personality, the direction you would have been going in. Uh, but um, but for theater performance performance maybe even art look at you went into plastering you know, sculptor yeah you know these these ways of expression uh, you know this would have been you you would have been definitely more of the artist you know that kind of person well I but, think I think my parents they the kind of support they gave me I felt they're neglecting something that I really wanted. You want to and they college? overlooked it. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I, I went to BOCES. Okay, You're right. familiar with BOCES. Yeah. And I went to take art, like you said. I went to take commercial art. They didn't offer commercial art at the time. So they stuck me in the trades. Ah. Okay? Right. But I really wanted to be a commercial artist. Yeah. And my brother Larry wound up being a commercial artist. Right. Not me. Right. That's something I really wanted. Yeah. Now, and my parents didn't push for it. Now, my question is this. Why do you think you didn't push for it once you got on your own? Um, I think I lost um, the desire. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I felt it was too late or... Is it possible? And here's a question. Is it possible that you had learned your place? And you weren't about ready to break out of your kind of settled into it. Right. Yeah. Okay, here's where you here's yeah. where you belong. Yeah. Kind of syndrome. Right. Don't do that. Right. Don't do that anymore. Yeah. And in fact, now, now that you have come to some sort of a vision here where you can clearly see that all those messages that told you here's where you belong, here's where you're at, now that you realize that those messages are not necessarily valid. Um, you don't have a reason to have to stick with that anymore. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, the yeah. truth is, I, I don't know what directions you would go in. I can't imagine, but I can't imagine anything stopping you. Who knows what can happen? Uh, it may be the world's not ready for uh, the, the genius art you would do. I don't know. Maybe they are. Who knows? Uh, maybe uh, two years from now, you'll have to lend me a million dollars because you made these wonderful sculptures. I don't know. <laughs> but I can't... Um, I can't picture you having any difficulty getting into acting. I can't picture it, you know, personally, just the way I've known you, the way you fight, you, you're, you're fascinated with it. You've often talked about it. You, you observe things that other actors do. You, you look at that. It speaks to you. Um, I would think that if you could find the time to do that, I don't know if you can. Not, we can only do so much. You know, you, you got your job. You have, you have a marriage. You also are, are playing in a band. I'm playing in a band, which, so, is, yeah. which is what I love. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm you doing can't do I all love. of it, so maybe maybe that's a direction you can't go in, unless, and I'm not saying you should do this, but you know, what if what if yeah. being an actor was more fun than being in a band? Oh no. Oh really? Okay. Oh, I love. Okay. Oh, I love what I'm doing now. Well, then, then I forget love. I said it. <laughs> I'm going to forget what you just said. Though. Yeah. What an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how could he suggest such a thing? No, I'm very, very. I think happy. we we may have uh, we might actually have a um, a uh, message here. Let's see what we got here. It says we got. Uh, I got sidetracked from my childhood dreams and passions because I let religion convince me that I was supposed to be something else besides what I wanted to be. My friends, family, and teachers fully supported me, but my church and pastors persuaded me that God wanted me to give all my dreams up and devote myself to the ministry. It was a big mistake to have accepted that. Uh, wow, there's someone else, you know, kind of relating well, to what we've been you talking gotta, about. You got to go with what your heart says. Definitely, and we have another comment here. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so here's a person who, and, and you know, a lot of people think, oh. 
calling to the ministry, well, that's more noble, you know, so you better do that. And somehow we, we put upon them this sense of awe. Well, that's not you, you know. There's a sense in which, um, now, I would want to say this and kind of speak to that. I really don't believe that what we do defines who we are either. I think that what we do is the way we find a place to express ourselves. And as a result, I think we can find that place anywhere. I mean, if we'd grown up on a, a planet on an earth where they didn't have such things as ministries or didn't have such things as guitars, that doesn't mean that we just kind of sit there like a bump on a log with nothing to do. We would find a way to be ourselves within the context to take to be able to respond to the things that are there. And, and as a result, one of the things that I think is extremely important is that let's not make radical changes in our life just to make changes. The most radical change we can make is the change we make about ourselves, how who we see ourselves as. And the reason is this. If you, you've probably heard this. A person wins the lottery. Ten years later, they're just as broke. You can take somebody who's in the ghetto, give them a great suit, put them in a nice apartment, kind of teach them things to do and do this and do and that. junk it up the next week. And they're gone. The truth is, when we change our circumstances, every human being whose circumstances are changed has a tendency to rebuild their old circumstances in the new circumstances. Mm. But when you change who you think you are, you become a person who responds differently and your circumstances change automatically over time anyway. So the most powerful changes you can make in your life are the changes where you change who it is you see yourself as. When you change the value you have on yourself, when you change the sense of dignity that you possess, when you change your right to be you, other people's right to be them, the, the, the desire to be kind and loving, when you change who it is you see yourself as the kind of powerful changes that come in your life as a result of that are who knows where that'll take you changes in circumstances alone are fun for a while and they fizzle if it doesn't accompany with a real internal change right so that's one of the reasons why we're talking about this because we're trying to talk about how you've seen yourself so that we might be able to get you to reassess some of those things and as a result of that reassessment you're going to behave differently you're going to present a different person to the world, and you're going to start getting different results as, uh, just, just naturally. And that's true of everybody, right? But anyway, look at this. It's, we're out of time. You know, wow. We've done this. And so you know, we'll, we'll continue this on. Next week, we're going to talk about something more specific. But you and I will talk about that separately uh, off the air. And then when we come back next week, we'll do that. So everybody, you got to love Phil. Uh, it's easy to do. It's the right thing to do. Oh. <laughs> and whatever. So I'm Bob Graves, the unconventional pastor, and we'll see you again on Sunday evening. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned in just a moment on the Florida NCG studio stage. We are going to be conducting the, the Cult of Honesty and Google Hangouts. And if you haven't received an invitation to Google Hangouts, well, then you aren't a member of the Cult of Honesty on Facebook. You should change that so that you can join us each week on Wednesday evenings. Stay tuned.